Praise God. So yeah, I titled tonight's message, Prepare to Be Bored. Amen. And um, you know, I have like multiple, like, I just know this. Whenever I was praying last night, uh, there was multiple, multiple thoughts moving in my spirit, moving in my heart. Um, and I know that uh, one, I kept hearing, or my prayer kept resounding to the Lord. Fill me up and pour me out. Fill me up and pour me out. Over and over was my prayer. Fill me up. And pour me out. But in the midst of this, the swirl of things that have been on my heart are, and ultimately, really the main thing, I think, if I was going to give it an idea that there was a main idea, uh, was that uh, drink offering, right? A drink offering. But also within that, I don't know if that will even mention it all, signs and wonders, the gospel, the changed heart, pouring out of self, looking like Jesus, loving like Jesus. Acting like Jesus, Amen. And I think that one of the one of the big things that was also in my heart was about the house of God and the people of God. And when I say the house of God and the people of God, I'm not talking about if you don't come to church, then you know you're backslidden. That's not what I mean. But I'm talking about the desire to be in the house of God and and the people of God. And and and, and I think I started my message off or what I wrote. To ask kind of like a question, not that I'm asking everybody to answer, but to more like a thought that how do you view the house of God and how do you view the people of God? Because uh, I wonder sometimes how people view the house of God and, and how people view the people of God. Do they want to be around the people of God? Do you want to be around the people of God? Um, you know, do, do they look forward to these opportunities and times? Uh, or is it more like a chore? Is it more like a responsibility? And deep down, kind of like an irritation. You know, like, oh, Lord, it's church again tonight. And, uh, and it's just a thought, you know, to wonder, how, how do we feel? And if it does feel like a chore or an irritation, is it because something's wrong with the church? Or is it because, or is it, or the people that are in that particular church? Or does it mean something's wrong with the heart of the individual that is feeling a certain way? You know, those all are good questions, right? I mean, I think they're good questions. And, and maybe in each case, there's some of both, right? Uh, but it but seems like the spiritually mature person would be able to discern that if they feel a certain way in their hearts towards a brother or sister in the Lord, that they would be able to recognize that Jesus doesn't feel that way, unless, of course, that person is causing harm to his body. That would, that would cause frustration. I mean, because we saw Jesus grab, he, 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 he methodically wove together that, that, that whip because of what they were doing to his father's house, right? It's, it's likely that many people, I don't necessarily think you guys in here, but it's likely that many people oftentimes see church activities as a waste of time. You know, but look, I want you to know that for the Old Testament worshiper of God, his whole life centered around the worship of God. And, you know, and, and, and they worshiped with their lives. It, it wasn't just things that they were doing. Their lives were their worship and they gave their lives in worship to God. Specifically in the sacrifices that were offered to God by the worshiper. They were literally a sacrifice because not only was the animal a sacrifice towards God and that it died a death, right? So a lot of times whenever we talk about a sacrifice, that's what we focus on, you know, how, you know, that the animal literally died. And that's kind of like the definition of a sacrifice. But I thought it was interesting whenever she spoke that word at the piano, she said, you're worthy of my sacrifice because what she was saying in her heart is that is that sometimes true worship and truly serving God is a sacrifice from the heart. But we're not talking about like because if because if we're feeling irritated about it, if we're feeling frustrated about it, we really don't want to be in the house of God. It's really it's really not. I mean, it's not that's not the kind of sacrifice that he's looking for. Amen. He's looking for a heart that desires to give it, but but he's looking for a heart that's pouring out to him. So, so the, but, but one of the big things about that sacrifice in the Old Testament was that the sacrifice was the worshiper's property. Like, it was his finances. It was his 
it would, it, it, he was having to sacrifice something whenever he was bringing his worship before the Lord. It cost him something is, is the point that I'm trying to make. And, and tonight, one of the sacrifice that I guess I'm kind of highlighting a little bit is it's not one of the blood sacrifices. It's, it's the drink offering. And the, and the purpose is not based on the importance of types of sacrifice. Rather, in a sense, all the sacrifices in some way, shape, or form reflect the Lord. And the drink offering also because he poured himself out, right? And so in a sense that I want you to know that the drink offering also represents uh, the sacrifice of the Lord. But I got to tell you that in a sense, it also represents you and it represents me. And the Apostle Paul, if you need to New Testament scripture, he said, we're being poured out. Upon the sacrifice of your love. You see, the idea of the drink offering was always connected to a burnt offering. was always connected to an animal that was on the altar. And the drink offering uh, consisted of a hen of wine. A hen was about a gallon. And what's interesting about a drink offering is, because we're talking about costing the worship or something right now, right? And, 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 and I'm going to fold it into some of the other thoughts that I feel like I'm having in my heart over this last few days. But what I want you to know is, is that the, the hint of wine is something even different than just having an animal. I'm not saying that it's because we know that the Lord requires blood. And we know that that's what got Cain in trouble in, in the book of Genesis. We know all of that. But what I do want you to understand is, is that not only did they have to plant the grapes, right? And, and not only did they have to cultivate them and harvest them, but they also had to stomp the grapes. They had to, they had to package them and they had to allow the grapes to become the wine. And then all of that, whenever it came time to worship the Lord, they basically just poured the whole thing out. They poured the whole thing out on, on the offering that was there. And a lot of times, you know, I was thinking about how, uh, before we get into that, though, I want because that's what they did. They took at least a portion of that was poured upon the whole burnt offering. And, and in our case tonight, we're the drink offering, right? We're the drink offering and we are the vessel. And so I wanted first, before we get into a little bit more of this, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about the vessel in question, because that's you and I. Amen. So let's take a look at Ephesians chapter two, verse 10 in the New Testament. And let's look at this scripture. It says, uh, where I'm in the ESV version, Ephesians chapter two, verse 10. It says, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in. Them. And so I want you to focus on the word workmanship just for a moment. Now, if you have your Strong's dictionary, because I know a lot of y'all have the, uh, those little tools in your phones and stuff like that. But if you look that word up, you're going to see the concept of fabric. And so what I need you to know is, is that fa fabric is the starting point to make some type of a garment, right? And so what he's saying is, is that God is working on us. Amen. And I want you to know that in order for God to prepare us to be a vessel that he can use, because he's saying that he's prepared uh, works in advance for you and I to operate in and to work in. And look, in, the, in, in these times, and we may not think about textiles a whole lot or denim or fabric, but I got to tell you, there's a whole lot of work that has to go into preparing fabric before it can ever be utilized for its intended purpose. I was looking for some, looking, I was looking this stuff up the other day, a while back, uh, because it was just on my mind. Because in these times, you know, work was hard, man. Work was arduous. And the name of this tool was called the uh, spinning mule, is what, is what it was back in the early 1800s. The spinning mule was how, first of all, you had to harvest the cotton, and then in order to turn it into thread, you had to kind of put it on this thing, and they'd sit there, and they'd work it, and they'd twist the cotton, and then it was rolling up, right? And they called that the spinning mule, and that's how they first made thread. But then once you had the thread, you had to put it on this thing called a loom, and it was this big old deal that had uh, certain threads going this way, and then you had to weave each thread through it, and then you... Okay, and then you weave another thread. Okay, you weave another thread. What I'm trying to say is this, is that if you and I are his workmanship, and the word fabric is in there, and that he's preparing you and I for good works that he had planned in advance 
for us that part of that process is that there's a work that has to be done. Amen? That's what I want you to know. I don't want you to be discouraged. I want you to understand that God's working in you. Amen? Because he wants to work through you. The scripture also says in Proverbs 25 and 4, I use this scripture a lot, but I just want to kind of put it, in, I, don't, I don't necessarily always break it down. Proverbs 25, 4 says this, take away the dross from the silver. Does everybody know what dross is? Pretty much the impurities, right? The impurities that are in the civil, silver metal. It's, and how do you take away dross out of silver? Anybody got an idea? How do you do that? Put the fire to it, right? You got to put the fire to it. The refiner's fire. And the hotter you get it, and the more that it allows those impurities to come to the top for the refiner to be able to see it in order to be able to remove it. And it says this, it said, if you take the dross from the silver, the smith has material for a vessel. And so what I want you to know is the smith is the person that's working, right? And, 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 and the way the King James words it is this, is that it's almost like now there's a vessel that's worthy of the refiner. Because he knows what's in it, you see. And the Lord is working in you and he's working in me. And many times when we find ourselves in trials, right? We don't really know why we're going through these things. I just want to encourage you to know he's always working. He's always working in us. The, the, the trial of your faith being much more precious than gold. Amen. It has to be tested. Our faith must be tested. And the more we learn about how to walk with God, the more we grow in our maturity, there are still going to be trials and tests that we're going to have to go through. And it's because he loves us and he's preparing us. And I want you to know that he's preparing you because he does want to use you. And I, and, I, and, I, and I want you to know that that's a big part of being a drink offering is that you would be used by the Lord. Now listen, every, the way God uses each individual is not always the same. Sometimes people are, are very bold witnesses and some, you know, you get the point. But, but nevertheless, he does want to use you and he wants you to be a reflection of, our, of Jesus. And he wants our lives to reflect that. It, true Christianity, let me just say it like this, is not us just coming here twice a week and sitting in a chair and hearing a couple of good songs and hearing the preacher preach a message. That's not real Christianity. But let me just say, let me reiterate this. Something takes time for the Lord to get us where he desires to get us. Amen. This is not in my, in my notes, but I say it a lot. But look, in order for him to be able to get us where he wants to get us, we're going to have to surrender. And we're going to have to be like the, like the song we, we were singing. My life is not my own. To you I belong. I give myself. I give myself away. I, we have to learn to yield and to give ourselves away. To let him work in our heart. Amen. And in our lives. All right. So the preparation of the heart to mold it to certain specifications so it can be used by God the way that he wants to use it. Listen, last night when I was trying to study the, the drink offering, I ran across this old scholarly paper by a German scholar about the drink offering, right? And I mean, I was reading it. It was like early in the morning. My eyes were getting blurry. And, 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 and I found this one little spot that I thought was interesting. He says, if we turn now to what was actually offered to the material substance of the Corabinum, 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 C-O-R-A-B-I-N-I-M. Now that was an interesting word that caught my attention. And let me tell you, and I'm not going to get into it. I really wish that we had time, but I think it would take too long. But that word Corbin immediately reminded me of when Jesus was talking to the Pharisees. He says, you call it Corbin. And he was talking about gifts being brought to the altar. He was actually having a big old dialogue. Well, let me just talk about that a little bit. He was having a big old dialogue with the Pharisees. And they were like, why do your disciples eat with hands unwashed? And so he says, the prophet rightly said, you bunch of hypocrites. He said, you're, you're over here focused on outward appearances. But, and he says, your lips say one thing, but your hearts are far from me. Because see, true True work of God, true worship towards God, true pouring out of self is not about external religion. It's about letting God have his way on the inside of the worshiper's heart. That's why it's important for you and I to understand that true worship costs 
the worship for something. Amen. It costs you your life. And true worship is you and I laying our life down before the Lord. True worship is not just that we sing it with Naya when she's singing. Praise is one thing. Worship is a whole other thing. We can worship the Lord in the midst of whenever we're singing songs. But true worship is our life. It's us giving our life to Him because He gave His life for us. Amen. And whenever we do that and we become, we allow Him to have His intimacy. See, we, we engage in this intimate relationship. Fruit becomes, becomes manifest. That's Romans chapter 7. He said, now that you, the law has been done away with in your life, you've been able to marry another, even Christ Jesus. Why? So that you can bear fruit unto God. And that, and when there's intimacy, fruit is produced. Amen. Amen. And, 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 and God wants to get us to a place of intimacy. But he says that to these Pharisees. He's like, you know, you make through your traditions, you nullify the word of God. Because, because see, the word of God says that you're supposed to take care of your mom and your dad. But you allow these people to get away with it because you allow them to say, whatever you wanted from me, I'm sorry, it's already been dedicated to the altar my gifts have already, all the money, I can't give you anything because I've dedicated it to the altar. See, the issue here is this, is that what, he's, what Jesus is talking about is, is that there's an issue of the heart. And, you're, and external religion is allowing people to go through motions. It's allowing people to feel good about themselves. And I've been saying this a lot lately. I don't know, maybe I need to title a message one time, punching the church clock or punching the God clock. And we just punch, we punch it. Okay, I read this much today. I did that. I worshiped today. Okay, I said my prayer. Okay, all went to church. Okay, we're just punching this God clock. All right, I know that's not y'all, but I'm just saying, I know that I've punched a God clock before, so I thought about it one day. <laughs> I have been in times, oh, here's church again. Oh, Lord, maybe I'll just sleep in. Got to go to church. No, you ain't got to go to church, my friend. As a matter of fact, we'd rather have 10 people that want to be in church than 50 people that really don't really want to be in church. Because can I tell you something? I'm not trying to run nobody y'all. I don't want you to misunderstand me. But I can tell you that if you're really going through the situation, you feel like it's a responsibility, you carry that with you. Does that make sense what I'm trying to say? I'm not saying that the Holy Spirit's not bigger than that. But what I'm saying is you people can carry that with them to the point where it can affect the, 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 the surroundings. It can affect the atmosphere. And so praise God. We, we, but what we do want is people to be able to come into the presence of God, to be able to experience the presence of God and for the Lord to minister to their hearts. Amen. And so. So, yeah, he said, no, he said, look. It's not what goes in a man. It's what comes out of a man. And he says, because, see, these are the things of the heart. And he goes on and he lists it. Things like pride. Things like adultery, lust. Uh, uh, you know, and he goes on and on. He says all these things. See, see, it's what's in a man is the evidence because it come, when it comes out of him. Whenever, whenever you and I begin to manifest things outwardly, what he's saying is, is that that's the symptom of what's really going on inwardly. And true religion, true Christianity, true gospel is something's changing on the inside. See, and so we can go through all of these rituals and we can go through all of these motions. But if you ain't changing on the inside, my friend, if you still talking to women the wrong way, if you still talking to men the wrong way, if you still got, if you still bound with lust in your heart and in your mind, listen, I'm not trying to beat you up. I'm trying to tell you that you can, that you're free. Now, I'm not trying to tell you you can be free. I'm trying to tell you whom the sun sets free is free indeed. And let me just say this while we're on it, because <laughs> I was in my mind, I've been thinking a lot about signs and wonders. And I've been thinking a lot about what's been happening in what I call the church, okay? And I'm going to say a couple of things. First of all, I have my, and listen, I'm not, I have my own opinion about the situation with, there's a big deal about demon spirits nowadays, right? Deliverance ministry, demon spirits, healing, supernatural, prophetic words. Dude, I'm all about whatever the Holy Spirit's wanting to do, I'm all about it. And some people in here might have differing opinions on deliverance, ministry, and all that. But you know what? One of the things that concerns me is that it almost appears to me that there's such a shift taking place that this is the new gospel. 
And I'm here to tell you that that is not the new gospel. Deliverance ministry is not the new gospel. And Jesus Christ and what he did for us at the cross is the gospel. That's never going to change. And I'll tell you this too. Now, people may not know this, but I'm going to let you in on a little secret. Long before somebody ever needed to be delivered of a devil, uh, what they needed to do was to let their flesh be crucified. And that's all throughout the New Testament. And the reality is, is that many times people are stubborn. We've all been stubborn. We haven't surrendered. We haven't coined a need with the Holy Spirit. And instead, in the act of defiance, we have chosen to open up doorways and we have allowed things to come take place in us on the inside of our heart and in our life. And had we just yielded to the truth of the gospel and let our flesh be crucified, then guess what? We would have saved ourselves a whole lot of heartache and a whole a lot of time, my friend. And listen, if we start casting devils off of people, out of people, however you want to call it, and we don't teach them how to live for the Lord, we don't teach them how to understand that they are a new creation in Christ Jesus, then guess what? They're going to be right back in the bind again. Lord, and, 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 if they, and if they're actually being taught and they don't learn how to yield, and somebody help me. If they don't learn how to yield, they're going to be caught up right back all over again. But anyway, that was a whole other story, you know, whole other story. You know, and I'll say something else. Look, look, I'm all about, I want you to know I'm all about the gifts. And I am not a cessationist. And I want the Holy Spirit to move. And I'm going to tell you right now, if the Lord wants me to give somebody a word of knowledge, I want to give somebody a word of knowledge. If the Lord wants to give me a word of knowledge, amen. And I'm pretty sure that he, you, I know he gave me a word of knowledge for one of the girls at the little, at the teen challenge thing. I wasn't expecting it, but he did. And praise God. It was the third time she had gotten the same word. Hallelujah. And so praise the Lord that that, that happened. But can I tell you for me personally, listen, and Lord, you know my heart. <laughs> he knows my heart. I could go the rest of my life and never get another word of knowledge. I'm telling you right now, I do not need a word of knowledge. I got, I want this word right here, my friend. This word right here, the written word of God. I'm telling you, I, by the grace of God, the Lord has taught me how to build my life upon this rock. And if you get up into this word and let this word get up in you, I'm here to tell you something. At the same time, I want the gifts to flow because I want God to be able to speak any way he desires to speak. But if you and I as mature believers... See, mature believers are going to get into the Word of God. Mature believers are going to learn the Scriptures. Your Word have I hidden in my heart that I not sin against you. Your Word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. His Word, I'm telling you right now, His Word, it's so beautiful. And it will transform your life. But that takes work, preacher. That's kind of what I'm talking about tonight. Kind of like when I'm talking about when I'm talking about pouring yourself out as a drink offering, I don't even mean it like I normally would have preached it, where you and I are gonna go knock on doors Saturday, maybe, or, we, or we're gonna go into Walmart, we're gonna tell somebody about Jesus, because that's pouring your life out too. That's a sacrifice, my friend. I'm talking about letting God get on the inside of you and change you. Change your idea about the house of God. Change your idea about the people of God. Change your, change your heart. If you've got a calloused heart towards the people of God or towards, oh, no, man, time is money. I'm busy, and I can't do that. Okay, time is, time is money, and we are busy, and, and we, do have, we do have responsibilities, and I understand that. And moms are busier than most men that work. I get all of that. I'm just trying to make a point that the people of God in, in, in the New Testament and the people of God in the Old Testament, I know it was a different life, but their life surrounded this. They were not punching a God clock. They were spending time. I was picking on Aaron because I knew what he was doing. He was over there talking and saying, I'm like, look at this dude. He's just getting home from offshore. He's already trying to plan Bible studies. And I was picking on him, but he didn't know that's actually part of what I'm, I was trying to talk about tonight. Trying to talk about the house of God, the people of God, learning that it's important that we love the people of God. And that whenever we have Bible study, it's not just that we're learning the scriptures, but it's like time of fellowship. And I'm not even trying to 
I'm trying. I'm not trying to politic to get people to come to Bible study because really and truly, just want people that want to come to Bible study to be a Bible or people that can come. Not everybody can even come. I get it. I'm trying to make a point though that that there's there's something powerful that happens when we allow the Holy Spirit to have His way in our heart and we begin to we begin to fellowship with the will of God. We begin to allow. But I don't like people up in the church. Well, Houston, we got a problem. Again, it might be the church. It might be the pastor. It might be the people in the church, but it might not be. It might be you, right? It might be your heart. Your heart might not be right. And look, if you don't like being in the church, you probably either need to get a new church or a new heart, <laughs> right? But I'm here to tell you that normal Christianity is that you love your brother. You love your sister. Praise God. And look, if you, I mean, I've done did this test on y'all three times already over the last year. If you look around the room, okay, man, you don't have to do it. But what I said was, if you look around the room and you make eye contact with everybody in here, and then what you do is, and then the question is, did anybody get on, you, did, did anybody get on your nerves when you just looked at them? Like, did it cause something to rise up on the inside of you? Mm -hmm. I don't like that person. You got all in your heart, buddy. Sissy, okay, something's not right with you, and but it, and it's okay because see when we when when we recognize it's not okay, but when we recognize it, then we can let the Lord deal with it, Amen. And He wants to deal with that. Praise God. All right, so you know with that drink offering, you know it, it, it cost them something personally and all that work, and then suddenly it was gone in a whiff of a vapor. Right? How wasteful must this have seemed to the heart of stone, not of flesh, that. Would not, could not feel the heartbeat of God. It was only consumed with his personal interest in wealth. This is probably the way that many people feel about the house of God or spending time with the people of God. It's a waste of time. I could be sleeping. I could be watching a video. I could be doing something else, right? But how much more of a shame is it when it's not just a hint of wine, but a whole life has been wasted? Oh, I'm going somewhere with this. Can you imagine that your whole life would be like a hint of wine? All the years of your life spilled out and wasted for what seems like no good purpose. And yet that is actually the way that most people on this earth are living their lives. Boats, trucks, nicer houses, job promotions. I work as a doctor. I retire after 40 years. I play golf for 10 years. And then I go, where do I go? And it's like one thing after the other. Living life and just... And so your life is being poured out one way or the other. You're, you're either pouring your life out for the things of God, the purposes of God, the plan of God, or you're pouring your life out for things that are connected to the world. And, and, and look, you know what's crazy is, is that whenever we pour our life out uh, for, for, for foolish things, their house, their car note, the time they spend on Google, Snapchat, Instagram, YouTube, their days are slipping by. Their lives are being poured out. And it's actually inevitable. All our lives are being poured out in one way or another. And look, even if we're good, gathering up all these possessions, we can't bring it with us. I'm not saying don't buy your house. I'm not saying don't get a new car. Don't say, think that I'm saying something that I'm not saying because that's not what I'm saying. You know, I'm not saying don't get your air conditioner fixed. <laughs> Amen? Okay, I'm just trying to say that there's one thing to pour your heart out, to pour your life out for the things of God versus pouring your life out for what you want to pour your own life out for, right? Let's look at Deuteronomy 16, 16, and then we'll take a look at 17. After. <clears throat> the Lord says three times a year, all your males shall appear before the Lord, your God, at the place that he will choose, at the feast of unleavened bread, at the feast of weeks, and at the feast of booths, they shall not appear before the Lord empty-handed. Boy, isn't that something? He said, don't, listen, I need you to come to worship me, but do not come to me empty-handed. It kind of makes me, like there's been times, and it happens to me every time, Lord, help me please remember. I'm not, you know, maybe you would say, well, I think you're going a little literal with this, with this concept, Pastor. But you know, there's been at least three times in the last year I went to another service somewhere and when they went to take up an offer and I didn't have no money in my pocket. And it made me feel weird. <laughs> like I wanted to give and I didn't have anything. 
So all I'm trying to say is, is this, is that the next time I go visit somewhere, I'm going to make sure I got at least a 20 in my pocket so I can, so I can throw that in the, in the offering plate. That is a very literal take on it. But you know, the idea is, is that you can't outgive God and you're recognizing how good God has been to you. And, you, and you're just giving back to him. Amen? It doesn't have to be a 20. It could be a 5. Praise God. All right. But look at verse 17. Every man shall give as he is able. Look at this. According to the blessing of the Lord your God that he has given you. See, what you had had already been given to you begin, to begin with. That's where a lot of people have trouble. I'm just going to be honest with you. Now, I'm, my, my message was really not focused on giving monetarily. But, but this is the concept right here. In a sense, it's giving money because even the animal costs money. The hen of wine costs money. It costs time. It costs money. The grain offering costs, costs them time and money and effort to, and then to just to go lay it all on the altar, right? And like I'm saying that to many people, it just seems wasteful. And even people in the world, they would look at Christians that give their time and their and their offerings and their tithes to the to the church, but you're not really giving it to the church, you're giving it to the Lord. Amen. Whatever you do, give. Amen. And and so uh he, he says, but but what I wanted to say is is that if you gave it, it was already given to you. It wasn't, and, and that's where I think a lot of people struggle with that. That, and I know, and the reason I say that is because I know myself that I struggled with that. Whenever I first came to the faith, that was when I did it. I started paying tithes early, but that was because that preacher didn't play. Man. Sister to it, she didn't play. You was feeling weird if you wasn't giving, but I gotta tell you. It wasn't a married heart when I was giving it. I was out there working in that pipe yard, getting Varsol on my legs and blisters. And I was like, man, this is my money. Gosh, dog, it on there. Give this money to it. You know, and then hallelujah, though, I did it. I did it. And then one day, I was like, you know what? The Lord loves a cheerful giver. <laughs> the Lord loves a cheerful giver. And I'm here to tell you, it is the best decision that I ever made was to give unto the Lord my finances, my time, because you cannot, absolutely you cannot outgive the Lord. There's just no way. And if you don't believe it, I'm just telling you, let me just say this. If you, if you do give to the Lord and you're struggling in your finances, there may be another reason why. Okay. And, and we'll get it. Maybe we'll get into that a little bit more. But if you're not giving to the Lord and you're struggling in your finances, well, you know, I can't, I can't really help you with that one because really and truly the word of God is clear. You're supposed to give them to the Lord. And, and he said, test me in this. And I know it's Old Testament, but look, and I did not plan on getting into giving this much, but look, the, the, the tithe was instituted before there was a nation of Israel. You understand that? It didn't come with the law. No, it came through Abraham when he gave a tenth to Melchizedek, which was long before. As a matter of fact, the scripture says that while Levi, who was the priest, the son of, of, uh, of Leah and Jacob, who ended up becoming the priestly tribe that Moses and Aaron came from, while Levi was still in the loins of Adam, Abraham, I'm sorry, while Levi was still in the loins of Abraham, meaning his grandpa, he wasn't even a thought yet, Abraham paid tithes to Melchizedek. So the tithe was instituted long before the law. Now check this out. And also, you may already know this, and I, I didn't plan on talking about it, but look, also Abraham was the father of the faith. The promise of justification by faith came to Abraham before the law ever was. So I'm not saying you have to do it this way, but the logical thing is, is that if I'm going to X out tithing, okay, because it was in the Old Testament, then you might have to X out justification by faith too, because that was promised in the Old Testament. That's what we're told long before the law was ever in existence. So I just want you to understand uh, understand that. So, but I want you to know that if you got it, he already gave it to you. And so whenever, and he's only asking for a tenth. A big part of the problem that we have, and I've been preaching this for a long time, is that we didn't handle the 90% correctly. Come on. <laughs> Pastor Matt, been guilty of that. I'll be straight up. Now, thank you, Jesus. I've gotten a lot smarter through the years, you know, by the grace, by the help, from the help of the Lord. Amen. But look, that's really the problem. It's not so much what we're doing with the 10%, but what we're doing with the 
to that we're supposed to be good stewards of what the Lord has given us. All right. And so he goes on to say in Exodus 29, 41, he says this. Well, no, let's go to, first go to Exodus 20, 24. It says, an altar of earth you shall make for me and sacrifice on it your burnt offerings and your peace offerings, your sheep, your oxen, and every place where I cause my name to be remembered, I will come to you and bless you. I just, I didn't, this didn't really have a lot to do even with the drink offer, but I was thinking about <coughs> the sacrifices. And you see where it says burnt offerings? Every time there was a burnt offering, there was a drink offering. And I, but what, the part that got me was this, was that in every place where I cause my name to be remembered, and I will come to bless you. And so it's kind of like everywhere that the children of Israel were going, the Lord's like, okay, I'm causing my name to be remembered, right? Jehovah Jireh. And Abraham built an altar, right? Jehovah Shalom, and, and they built an altar. And Jehovah, and they built an altar. And for you and I, like, an altar, again, is connected to a sacrifice of praise. And it's connected to you and I being, listen, I'm not going to, I'm not going to shrink away. I, I'm, I'm excited about this. The Lord put this on my heart, probably been a year now, that he says, as surely as I live, the glory of the Lord will fill the earth. And he's looking for people like you. And he's looking for people like me that will allow an altar to be built everywhere that he helps us to remember the name of the Lord. I'm here to tell you right now, he wants us to remember his name when we're at work. He wants us to remember his name when we're at the house. He wants us to remember his name whenever we're at Walmart. He wants us, if we are going to truly belong to the Lord, amen, he wants us to remember his name. He wants us to be a drink offering. He wants us to pour our life out upon the sacrifice of Jesus. And that's what the drink offering was all about. The burnt offering was offered and that hint of wine was poured on there. <sighs> And it just caused a big old vapor of smoke to go up into the nostrils of God. And the Lord would say, this is a sweet smelling savor unto me. I'm here to tell you right now, you want to know how you can please God? Because I don't know about you, but he sure enough has pleased me. Amen. By saving me, by calling me. And the, one of the ways you can please him is, is that you live your life for him. Everywhere that you go, that you acknowledge him with your finances, that you acknowledge him with your speech, that you acknowledge him with your attitude, that you acknowledge him when you come into the house of God, amen, and everything is a condition of the heart, that you acknowledge him whenever you realize your, your brothers and your sisters, and if you have something that's in your heart that's not right, you at least recognize it, listen, we all, we all going through this, my friend, we're all growing, we're all being, a, we're all in a process, but when we recognize it, we don't sit there and talk about our brothers and sisters, we prefer our brother and sister over ourselves, and we get our heart Right before the Lord. Because listen, do you know what, how do you feel when the Holy Spirit's moving on your heart? I mean, one thing you can feel, I'm, I, I'm, you don't have to answer. Do you feel peace when the Holy Spirit's moving on your heart, right? When you're in the presence of the Lord. And, and there could be some things going on, but you feel the peace of God. Amen. Sometimes you might even feel joy, right? How, how do you feel when you're frustrated with something? You can feel the difference. You know what I'm talking about? And so if you're having an issue in your heart with a brother or a sister and you feel frustration in your heart, that's not the Holy Spirit. That, that is, well, I mean, at best it's your flesh. <laughs> and your flesh needs to be crucified. And you need to bring that to the Lord. And you need to work with Him and allow Him to have His way. And He'll replace it with love, joy, peace, long-suffering. Amen? Those are all fruits of the Spirit that are interconnected to relationships with uh, other people. Amen. You look at Exodus 29, 41. Oh, wait, before you go, go back to that one. Look at this. And I know we're not in this. Go back to the Exodus 20, 24. I know we're not in it for this, but look at this. He, remember, he said, I cause my name to be remembered. I will come to you and bless you. Now, unfortunately, and I think I got some stuff in my notes here, but unfortunately, sometimes we can start doing stuff because we just we want to get blessed. Because we know if we do this, you know, we'll, we'll be blessed. That's not the right. No, this is, this is us being, whether you bless me or not, Lord, I want to be a drink offering to you. Whether you bless me or not. I want to be a, I want to live my life as a sacrifice unto you. Not, not to mention what he already pulled me out of. Amen. Not to mention when he came and he rescued me from.
from. That's what I preach to the teen challenge ladies. I preach search and rescue. <laughs> the Lord, like a Navy SEAL, came in and did an extraction, right? And I was chained into a dungeon, according to Matthew chapter 12. I was under the strong man's control in a house where I had no hope. But the Lord showed up and he did an extraction and he delivered me out because, see, the Lord bound the strong man. It's like he tied him up in a chair and stuck him in the kitchen and said, you can't move because I done went to the cross and I defeated your power. I took authority over you. And now those that will believe in my name, they will be my sons and they can operate in my power and authority. And, they, and that your power no longer has dominion over them. They are free, free, free indeed. That's the word of God, my friend. And if you'll learn to believe that, surrender to that and partner with the Holy Spirit in that, you will experience it in your life. But you got to want to experience it in your life. All right. That's another story. But okay, let's look at Exodus 29, 41. He says, the other lamb you shall offer at twilight. These are talking about burnt offerings. And shall offer with it a grain offering and a drink offering as in the morning for a pleasing aroma, a food offering to the Lord. I can't just get that out of one time. I think I was going to try to preach off a message and I was going to when I was using my iPad. And what I did was I never did get around to it, but. I had a picture, it was like a satellite picture, and it was nighttime, and you could see all the lights, because probably because of cities, right, That from the satellite, but what I did was I put little whiffs of vapor coming up from each one of those areas of lights, and, and I was just thinking, this might be what it kind of looks like to the Lord. That, you know what I'm saying? I mean, I'm using it kind of like illustratively, but Jesus said, you are the light of the world. And that whenever you got saved, the light of God came to be on the inside of you. And that when God looks down upon the earth, amen, he sees all those little lights of all those people that live for him, amen. And every single time you lay your life down, you treat your brother right, you love your brother and your sister, you come into the house of God to give him your praise and your glory. You tell somebody at Walmart about what the Lord did for you. Every time it's like, Pouring that drink off her, and there and there goes all that incense. Just going up there, that sweet smelling savor. Going up to the Lord. I want you to be able to see it with your eyes because I'm telling you that is true. And if you're going to pour your life out for something, you need to, by the grace of God, to help us, Lord, to pour our life out for you. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. So look, um, well, I was going to talk a little bit about the parable of the talents, but instead of that, for sake of time, let's go to Acts chapter 2, verses uh, 42 through 47. It says, the fellowship of the believers. That's the caption in the ESD version. It says, and they devoted themselves. This is what I wanted you to see about the house of God. It, look, what, look, this is what the early church did. Okay. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers, and all came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done. Amen? So I want you to see that it's not just the signs and the wonders. As a matter of fact, the signs and the wonders, it seems, were interconnected to what they were doing. This is what they devoted themselves to. The apostles teaching. They were teaching about Jesus. They were teaching about what Jesus had done for them. And the fellowship. They fellowshiped with one another. They spent time with one another. They, they, they weren't irritated. You know what I'm saying? And as a matter of fact, the whole heart of the book of Acts right here is that they were of one mind and one accord. Yeah. They were walking in the unity of the spirit. Mm -hmm. And, and look, we're, and we're talking about supernatural signs and wonders. I'm just, I just want to remind you of something, and I'm not. I, I, so look, what did I say? I said, I'd rather have the word of God than a word any day. And let me say this, I'd rather have fruit than a gift any day. Now, that's me. You, other people may not feel like that. But let me tell you this. The church of Corinth, the church of Corinth, the apostle Paul said, you, become, you come behind no man in any gift. In other words, the gifts are flowing out of you, my friend. But, but you know what resulted from it? A bunch of division. A bunch of division. A bunch of selfishness. And let me tell you something. Jesus is not about division and selfishness. And if we can't operate.
operate in gifts and supernatural signs and wonders without allowing ourselves to get puffed up and without taking away from the Lord, then, then you know what? I'll be, just, I'll be just as happy having the Word of God. Now listen, I, I'm not saying it has to be that way. It's not supposed to be that way. It's not supposed to be that way at all. It's supposed to be that everything's flowing, that the fruit is being produced, that the gifts are flowing, that the super, that people are being healed. Hallelujah. That, that, that words are going forth. That's how it's supposed to be. But I'm going to tell you something. You can have all the gifts and you can have a spirit of division in your midst. And, and Jesus don't like division. And Jesus don't like nobody getting his glory. Jesus wants all the glory for himself. And, and, and that's the only point I'm trying to make. The fruit of the spirit. Love, joy, peace, long suffering, patience, temperance, kindness. Produce it in you, Lord. That, see, that, that's the sign of maturity. That's the sign of mature Christian living. Love. True love. You know, the other day, I talked about that scripture out of John where he said, in John 13, 34, and 35, this was the Amplified, but you know, it's, you can put that up there if you can, but he said, I give you a new commandment, John 13, 34 through 35. I give you a new commandment that you should love one another just as I have loved you, so you too should love one another. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples if you love one another. And then in the Amplified, it says in brackets, if you keep on showing love among yourselves. So, you know, one of the one of the things that I was thinking about in this particular passage, the last time I used it, I was using it more kind of like, I don't want to say a negative sense, but it was more like if you love your brother, then then you shouldn't, then we shouldn't be backbiting, right? If you love your sister, we shouldn't be gossiping and slandering. Okay, but now that we got that clear, because I'm pretty sure we got that clear. Right? We've been talking about that off and on for a year. Okay, but now we got that clear. We're solidified on that. I'm not really supposed to do that. But then, but now, but what is love? Is love just that I don't slander you? Is love just that I don't backbite you? Or that I don't gossip about you? How does love look? You know what I mean? I'm going to let you just kind of ponder on that. Matter of fact, Holy Spirit, I pray that you make them chew on it for the rest of the week. Make me chew on it too. What does it mean to love? What, is that, what does that feel like? What does it feel like to know that Jesus did something for me? And what does it feel like if I love my, if I do truly love my brother and sister? Like in other words, am I happy to see that they made it to the house of God tonight? I can tell you right now, whenever I see people show up in the house of God, I'm excited. Praise God. I'm excited for the opportunity to worship. And I don't know, people, somebody say, yeah, well, you're the pastor. You're supposed to be. No, it don't work like that, my friend. We're all supposed to be excited that, one, that each of us are doing okay, that we made it, that we're doing good, that we made it to the house of God. I want you to, I want you to win. I'm not trying to be a life coach and I'm not trying to be a cheerleader. When I say I want you to win, I want you to live for the Lord. I want you to pour yourself out like a drink offering. And when you face him on that day, I want you to hear those words, well done, my good and faithful servant. Amen. I know that that's my heart. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Let's just go ahead and get the singers and musicians to come up. You know, I did have this long passage out of Matthew 18. As they're coming up, Peter came up to him and said, Lord, how many times may my brother sin against me and I forgive him and let it go? As many as up to seven times, Jesus answered, I tell you not up to seven, but 70 times seven. That's actually what it says in the Amplified. The ESV says 77, but it's really 70 times 7. And he's not talking about count to 490 and then you're good. <laughs> there's, there's actually more meaning to this. It's talking about until the end. You don't stop forgiving. Your heart and your life has to be right before the Lord. You have to forgive. And you can say that you've forgiven, but if you're not... If you still got that animosity and that all in your heart, then something may not be right, right? And anyway, but the whole story, you remember the, 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 uh, the master, the guy owed him money. He said, it's time for you to pay. I'm about to put you and your family away. And he got down on his knees and he was begging, no, no, please don't do it, Lord, please give me. And so the, the, the master like, delivered him of his debt. And then what does he do? He turned around. It was about $10 million. According to the Amplified, it was 10,000 uh, talents. And, he cut, and, and they say it's probably about $10 million. 
or ten million dollars worth of money, and then and then he turns right around. Somebody owed him twenty bucks, and he grabs him by the throat. He said, "You won't pay her." And and I know that we aren't probably walking around like that, but sometimes we are holding grudges. Sometimes we're holding grudges, and all I'm just trying to say is that part of being a drink offering is also connected to that too, to where we truly learn to release that into the hands of God. And the only way that we can do that is if we're at least willing to go to the Lord and to say, Lord, I want to forgive this debt because you forgave my debt. And Lord, I need you to help me. I release it into your hands, and I'm asking you to have your way with it. And I'm telling you right now, it will free you up. If you and I can learn to root, truly forgive people that have hurt us, people that have done us wrong, and truly release that and let a work of the Spirit do, do that work in our hearts and lives, it will free us. Amen. Spiritually, it will set us free. Let's worship the Lord a little bit tonight. Amen. If you need prayer, the altars are open. Amen.